So let's see if this is going to work. Hey, look at that. Uh, so uh, I am uh, an advisory member of the Drupal uh, event organizers working group. And um, this is a, uh, a plug for the new events section on drupal.org. So if you're hosting an event, um, I heard a couple of people mention, uh, you know, design for Drupal, GovCon, all those sorts of things. Um, make sure your event is posted to drupal.org. Uh, it's the best way to, for people to know that your event's happening and for um, the Drupal Association to be able to kind of keep track of all the events that happen throughout the year. So if you go to drupal.org slash community slash events, you can uh, learn more about um, the event organizers working group and how to add your um, add your event and, and get your pin on that, uh, that map right there. There's also a uh, Drupal Providence Slack channel in the Drupal Slack. So if you're in the Drupal Slack, you can join Drupal Providence. And, um, you know, I, I hang out there. Um, I'm sure a few others hang out there. So you can, uh, you can feel free to ask questions. You can feel free to, um, you know, post, you know, if you had, uh, you need a recommendation on, um, uh, you know, an agency or service to work with, any, any, any sort of questions you have, you know, feel free to jump in there, drop, uh, drop those in. Um, I also post videos. So the recordings from the uh, from the meetups, um, I will post them in there as well. So that way people um, can get them, can get them everywhere. A couple of uh, events coming up. Uh, there is Drupal DACH, which is actually the Austria Drupal users group. They're doing uh, lightning talks and presentations. It's a virtual event. Uh, so you can join that on the 20th of May. Um, there is a Boston Drupal meetup. Uh, Mike Miles does a great job um, running that. And uh, I do not know uh, what the topic is because they just had their meetup on Tuesday. So the next one wasn't posted, but the um, the date is uh, uh, six eight. So if you're interested in that, um, it is also virtual. So you don't have to, you don't have to go anywhere. You can just uh, sit right near uh, where you're most comfortable. Uh, SF Doug, which is a San Francisco Drupal users group is, um, always having events. It's awesome. And they have them at different times of the day too. So if you're on the East Coast, sometimes they're more in the afternoon, sometimes they're more at the like five, six o'clock hour. Um, and sometimes they're later at night. So uh, good variety. Their next um, talk is about DDEV and Gitpod, which I don't actually know what that is. Um, so you might want to check that out if you're interested in finding out how those two things can build you a full dev environment. Last but not least, uh, the next Drupal Providence, we are quarterly. So we're uh, looking at August 25th for our next event. And um, I have to get my act together and determine what we are going to do for a topic. So if you're not following us on Twitter or um, on uh, signed up for the meetup page, I suggest um, jumping on those two things because that's usually where we announce stuff. All right, uh, enough about me. Let's talk about Jason. So uh, as uh, most of you may have heard, Jason and I have worked together in the past. Um, we go way back, but Jason's been building websites or building the web, as we like to say, since 1994. He specializes in typography. If you've ever heard Jason talk, it was probably about type. Um, he's been focused on that for the last 10 years. Um, he is one of the leading experts in using variable fonts. I can attest to that. And you're actually going to hear a little bit about that tonight. He call, consults with nearly every major type and web browser company. Um, and he uh, has led design of type, typographic systems used by millions of people um, every day for entertainment and government platforms alike. Um, for those of you that don't know, Jason is an avid bike rider. He also has uh, two dogs that he um, photographs regularly and you can follow their uh, social accounts for all of their um, daily walks. He has talked at so many events, I am not gonna get into it. And uh, <laughs> he is a very avid speaker, uh, all around good guy. Uh, everybody, please welcome Jason Palmatel. 
Thanks, John. No problem. <laughs> um, I just, um, at, at least a fraction of what John said about me is true, which is, which is nice. Um, but I, I think um, where things have really been interesting for me, and, and this is one of the reasons why I love coming back to, to Drupal events, is the very first talk that I gave about web typography was at DrupalCon in London in um, 2011. And, uh, and the reception there with the Drupal community to topics like this has been amazing. And I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to speak in, um, on three different continents at DrupalCons about, um, about type almost every time. And, uh, and so that is gonna be a big part of what I talk about today. Um, but um, a lot, uh, there's, uh, there's so much that we could talk about about this platform um, I'm going to be focusing on a little bit more um, the design system side, but the design system and the site building and and the architecture and how we host it are all very tightly coupled. So, um, so it's going to kind of span everything from how we figured out the design, um, how it behaves to how it's been implemented and what that means for accessibility and performance and a whole bunch of other things um, and how um, what has really been magical about this is the cooperation and collaboration between the agencies themselves, uh, myself sort of sitting in the middle and, and the team at OOMF, including Jay Hogue, who may or may not be joining us tonight. I think he might've forgotten about it. Um, and I, I did remind him this morning, but I, you know, oh well. Um, uh, he was there, the director of design, um, one of their lead front end uh, folks, Jordan Caldwell, and one of their, a uh, couple of their, their back end folks, um, uh, Phil and Ben. Um, I'm totally drawing a blank on Phil's last name. Ben Hamlin is the other developer. And, and uh, that collaboration is what made all of this possible. So what I'm going to show you are how all of these things are, are tied together. Um, so um, what is the project? The project was um, brought about by suffering through the pain of looking at government agency websites in Rhode Island be managed in static HTML and CSS. Um, and most of them still are. So while technically some of them are PHP pages, it's only to get some includes, they're still managing all of the sites in Dreamweaver. I'm not kidding, I wish I were. Um, and, uh, and so it's just, it's been, um, it's been a huge challenge. Um, it's been a huge barrier to providing really high quality web services. And so um, I've been working with um, this fellow named Tom Vile, who actually came to the Drupal PVD meetup uh, five or six years ago, um, and when we first started talking about this, and uh, and finally it got to the point where we could turn it into a real project to create a Drupal-based platform that could be used to create instances of that to create all the agency websites. So um, eventually, what this turned into was a two-year contract to develop the platform, design it, develop it, and migrate around 70 or so websites onto this, this platform. And so we finally got everything lined up um, around this time last year. We almost lost the whole thing with the lockdown with the pandemic. It was literally the day before we were supposed to have the contract signed. Um, the lockdown was announced, everything got put on hold. And it actually turned out that not only did COVID derail this thing, but COVID actually brought it back to life. Um, the, the relief funds that were released to the different states um, became available because we decided to pivot a little bit and make sure that the first sites that we focused on were based around COVID relief. And, and that was actually a huge win uh, for me personally, seeing what was going on in the state and what was going around nationally um, and how bad most of those sites were was a huge motivator in, in trying to pivot this to do something substantially better, really transformatively better for our state. Um, now, prior to that, I actually spent uh, about two years working with the state of Georgia on their design system and, and platform. Um, so I did learn a lot of really good lessons about multi-site versus um, site factory, for example. Um, multi-site um, in, in Georgia, is 80 plus sites running in this one multi-site install. And as the developer experience, it was 
really difficult. Um, so that was actually one of the things that factored into, into our decision uh, to move toward this architecture using Site Factory. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and I'm going to start showing you some stuff. So I'll start with the first site that we launched. Now, um, I, I also, I don't want to go too deeply into this because I want to show you some of the stuff behind it, but um, we went from starting our initial user research. Uh, we're really able to, like the contract was signed, the ink was dry, we were able to get running in the beginning of June. And by early September, we had our earliest prototypes and we launched this site the second week of December. And I'm tremendously proud of the pace which with we, we kept up with this and the amount of functionality that we delivered. So this is a logged in window. I'm gonna switch over to one that is not. Um, so you can see it a little bit uh, more tailored here. Now, there's a tremendous amount going on. Um, first off, uh, just some real, real basics. So one of the things we wanted to solve for was better accessibility, uh, better web performance, because we spent the first week of the, the, the COVID lockdown with the Department of Health site crashing because the load was just through the roof, um, as was every other health site in the country. Um, with the launch of this, with our focus on accessibility and performance, this site benchmarked three times faster. It had one quarter of the data load on that initial page, and half of that came from the chatbot from IBM. Um, Nix that out, and we would have had about a 350K homepage. And, and the design of this was driven by the analytics. So we created tons of components, and I'm going to show you lots of different pieces and parts to this, um, but it was driven by what are the content needs and what are the things that are changing on a regular basis and what's the information that we need to provide. And, and so scrolling back up to the top here, we looked at the analytics and looked at the top destinations for people and that's what we highlight. So that's our hero. Um, you know, a, a COVID site doesn't need a massive photo. It needs to get people information fast. So we made sure that that's what we did with these icon cards. So in this component, um, this is you know one component. It's using the layout builder on these landing pages um, to allow us to do one through four columns. If we want to do full width like this photo, we can. If we want to pin it to the content width, we can do that too. And uh, we're able to create all of these uh, and then give them all the capabilities and they're actually maintaining this in three different languages in addition to all these other single page uh, multi-language content uh, in order to reach all the different audiences within the state and so so the other languages are done oops, um, with Drupal's built-in multilingual capabilities and that's all here in settings. And this is actually gonna highlight some of the other things that we built into this uh, for accessibility and better user experience. So when we go in here, you can have the language switcher, but you'll also see we have some other controls. Um, there are actually five different color themes that we built into it. And, and each one has a corresponding dark mode and you can either switch it intentionally or allow your operating system preference to take over. So if you have your phone or desktop OS set to dark mode, when you come to the site, you'll see it like this. And otherwise you'll see it like this. But if you have a preference one way or the other, you can always set it manually. And that was something that came up with a bunch of accessibility experts that I, I was chatting with over the last couple of years um, to make sure that we always offer both elements to this, an automatic thing based on someone's global preference or a specific preference for this. We also built in adjustments that you could make to font size, line spacing, and even word spacing, uh, because we, we know that for some folks with dyslexia, um, this makes reading comprehension much, much greater. Uh, there's a small subset of people with dyslexia that suffer from a condition called crowding, and simply by doing those two small actions, increase the line spacing, increase the word spacing, we can improve their reading comprehension by 50%. So small things like that, that we can put in the hands of the users themselves, allow them to tailor the experience to exactly what they need. And as long as we're careful about how we code it, everything still just works. And so all of this stuff is driven 
um, the typographic system um, is using variable fonts to reduce the font download and allow us to make small adjustments to type weight when we go back and forth between light and dark mode, um, but also reduces the number of assets that we need to load in order to get all the different weights that we're going to use. So we have something slightly bolder when you make a link, uh, different levels of boldness in all of the, the different, uh, different levels of headings, uh, different levels of, of weight contrast in light and dark uh, inverted contrast mode. So, so we're really making use of this. We're effectively probably, I guess if you were to equate it to static fonts, we'd be bringing in seven or eight different weights to uh, satisfy all of these different use cases. Um, in this case, we only have to load one file. And, and so, so that's, we're really doing a lot of interesting stuff, uh, I think, with this as well as scaling the type. Um, so as the screen size gets smaller, we are also scaling the type size down a little bit so that it's more appropriate for the device that you're on. And then when you look at uh, some of these other areas of, of the site, um, dig into uh, some of these other sections. Oh, that wasn't it. Let me go back up to the top. Just wanna get into a different section of the website and just show you some of the other usability things that we did where the secondary navigation actually stays anchored to the side as you scroll on a small screen. So we always keep it within thumb's reach. Um, so behind that, I'm gonna sort of shift gears a little bit and, and go back to the beginning and talk about the design system itself. So. We were using Pattern Lab as the mechanism to house it, um, but behind that, you really uh, the design system is really about what are the rules governing the experience, and and so we started off by working through some style tiles and then started to develop some of these pages. This is in Adobe XD, and uh, and Jay and I started looking at expanding that color palette from the core in the top left here. Uh, and started to expand it to some other color families. And we sort of created these little thumbnails as a way for us to look at these different color palettes. And you can see as we sort of, you know, you can see a lot of these things, the origins of them look pretty similar to what you just saw in the browser. Um, not all of them are exactly the same. Some of them evolved a little bit, but now you can also see how some of the different color palettes worked as we started to explore different patterns and colors and light and light modes. And so this was our way of initially exploring this, which we then very quickly started to move into the browser. So we started working in Pattern Lab. Pattern Lab uh, allows you to create this sort of self-contained website that I'm showing you here that contains all the pieces and parts. And what I'm starting with here is the color. We wanted to make sure that, you know, we're not um, the whole brief here was not to create one website. The brief was to create a platform that could create nearly a limitless number of websites and still allow them to feel somewhat unique. Um, but we wanted to have some common through lines. So the typography would remain the same and we would have several colors that would remain consistent throughout. And then we wanted to create the different color palettes that they could choose. And we wanted to find a way to do that based on experience that we had uh, that I had with the with the Georgia system and, and where we thought we might be able to try and improve upon that a little bit. We came up with uh, what you're seeing here are little snapshots of each of the light and dark modes of the five different color themes that we created. So we have Scarborough Beach, Federal Hill, Wickaboxit Forest, Block Island Lighthouse, and Blue Shutters Beach. And all of the Rhode Island centric naming is courtesy of Jay Hogue, the director of design at, at, at OOMF. He did a really wonderful job. And if we scroll down, then you can see all of the ways we use the colors. And, and we did a lot of interesting stuff with HSLA as the color model. And we added in a couple of fallbacks. So, so everything does work in IE 11. Um, we still have a little bit of work to do to tidy up some issues there. But generally speaking, we have good fallbacks there. They still get a really solid experience that looks very much like what everybody else would get. But everybody else is using really modern CSS. We're using a lot of grid, we're using a lot of CSS custom properties. And we use HSLA to allow us to do a lot of transparencies. 
So that way, when we layer these things together and we switch from light and dark mode, oftentimes we only have to change the background color and the text color. All the other layering of these elements in between just work based on the level of transparency in that color system. So you can see here the whole family of colors that we're using throughout the design system. And then Jay came up with this really cool way of visualizing what would be an accessible level of contrast. And so as you look at these things, these are all the different combinations of every single color. If it doesn't have a green checkbox, we don't use it. Um, the, only, the only way that you can use it is if you've got yellow, if you're using the text large enough on that combination, then it would pass. Um, we're well past WCAG 2 AA compliance. We're actually close, close to three in almost all cases, uh, AAA rather. Um, in, in trying to make sure that we maintain uh, accessible contrast ratios throughout the system, we don't give the admin users a choice. All they can do is they can pick a background color and then the text color is done automatically. So that's, uh, that's all of the, the different color combinations and we just keep this in the pattern library so we can quickly double check things um, and, and see what other combinations might look like. And I'm just gonna scroll down past that and you start to see here are some of the fonts we're using, uh, Work Sans and Roboto Slab are the, the two typefaces that we're using. And we're, we're by default using the variable versions of those. And then we have the static versions of it as a fallback for older browsers like IE 11. Now Quaha gives you the ability to kind of go through and see, now I selected the global components. If we wanna look at all of the text components, you can see all the different heading levels and how all those different styles work. And then we can go down and see what do the lists look like and what do buttons look like, what do forms look like. So, so the, the, the idea with Pattern Lab is you work to create these small little snippets. And, and so what's really, uh, another really handy thing here is if I go back here and look at the list, for example, I can click expand on this pattern and see what is the twig or the HTML look like. And so this is a really helpful way for us to then expand the usefulness of Pattern Lab. We maintain this as a separate repository that gets pulled in during the build process to the theme. So other people can use it. And we've already had at least two people, uh, two organizations take the pattern library and pull styles into another application on another platform. So we've already won, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of making this a common repository of the design language for the state. They may not implement all of the bits and pieces, but they do get an awful lot of it. And so you can see as we go through, um, uh, let's see, uh, what would a file look like when we add it in here. So we have a file listing component to add files from the media library. Um, what would something look like to add in various uh, different kinds of design components? Um, what does the language switcher look like? What does a media item look like? And, and this is just all the different permutations when you have it aligned, when you have it with a caption or without and we lean heavily into paragraphs here in assembling the content so that we tie that into the pattern with some useful design switches built into the UI. So we actually are allowing a lot of the design to happen in the admin experience, but we've coded for all of that in the pattern library. So we can make sure that we always get the best possible outcome when people are, are seeing the rendered output. So uh, I, I could go on for quite some time about Pattern Lab, but um, I wanted to show you a little bit of how it's integrated. And so I'm going to go back over here and actually switch over to the not logged in window again. So we saw some things of different, different content components on the home page. And then when you move to the interior pages of the website, you can see that we maintain something that's a little bit more expected in terms of secondary plus navigation visible on the side. And this is some fairly basic content that, uh, that that's here. If we wanna like sort of explore a little bit more, look at quarantine and isolation, 
We've got more different kinds of content components where they've added a card that has a background color. And we've got some basic formatted text. And down here, they've added in some different uh, little accordion items with, with formatted content inside. And inside each of these, you can actually use all the same content components that you can use everywhere else. So if you want to add a video, add an image aligned to one side, if you want to embed other kinds of content, um, you can easily do that. And um, they actually have instances where they're embedding tables of uh, food site data in from a Google spreadsheet that actually is a, a live update as well. So there, there's some interesting stuff that they've been doing on the COVID site particularly. Um, and then they have, it's easy for them to have a mix um, in languages. Uh, so they're able to add pages in all these other languages and it, it will render correctly. Um, so it gets the right language encoding um, and, and all that stuff works. So we've enabled those languages, but we haven't enabled so the full translation of them. But if we go back, like if we click over uh, Spanish, for example, that will actually just take us to the homepage with the language preference now set to Spanish. So now, because they're actually maintaining all of this as translated content, they get all of the same stuff here. And then, you know, if we want to switch back, we can just go back to the settings and language menu. So that's the COVID site. Um, here's another one, uh, the Office of Healthy Aging. Uh, they had a, got a real kick out of me riding my bike with my uh, 85 year old dad. Um, so that was a pretty good sign of healthy aging. Um, but this is another one of, this is the Block Island, uh, Block Island Beach. I think it was Block Island Beach um, uh, color palette. Um, you can see we have this little emergency alert banner. Um, they can add these on a site level basis, or we have a hub site where we can add them and push them, put these emergency notifications out to the entire system. Uh, we haven't had to do that yet, so that's been good. But um, uh, but that's something that you can open and close, and then it will just it will sort of preserve your preference. But you can always come back to it. So you can see this one has a different set of layout components. They've got some of those little icon cards, but now they've mixed it with a gallery of, of photos. Uh, and then another sort of block quote with an image here. And then they've got these little promo items that take you to different parts of the website. And then we maintain a, a fairly consistent structure for the footer as well, so that uh, some of these things will stay as familiar touch points. You'll always have this banner up top with the same settings and languages, letting you know it's an official site. Um, but they, they've got um, their uh, press release functionality, which is going to syndicate upstream, going to uh, going to the main Rhode Island.gov site once that has been converted over to this platform. Uh, so they're and they're all able to maintain these things using workflow as well. Um, so they have content authors who can post things, but they can't make it live. Um, and they then they've got content publishers who are notified whenever they submit something for review, and then site admins who can uh, really kind of do just about anything on the site. Um, We've created a number of different demo sites, including um, this documentation site, um, where we've actually documented all of the features. And so how you create all the content types, what are all the content components? Uh, we've been writing a little bit more content guidance for people. Uh, we've got a number of different demo sites that we've created that will let people see all the different color themes. And we've kind of built those up with different combinations of, of components. Um, and a little bit about what the ECMS is is all about. So this is this has been really really a lot of fun to do um, because we're now um, we've we've got five sites live on the platform and we have ten more that are within a couple of weeks of of being ready to go live and um, and seeing people now start to kind of stretch their wings with it is really exciting to see what they decide to do. Um, so another one of the sites that's in the works is the Office of Child Support Services. Um, you can see it's another one of the lighter color palettes. I got gorgeous photograph for the top and um, layered the different combination of components here. And then if you take a look at some of these different pages, um, you know they've done a really nice job of starting to bring everything over, um, connect uh, with new images. Um, it's not always the most interesting. 
uh, imagery, but they're they're really working hard at it, and it's it's really wonderful to see uh, because not only have we been able to give them a really accessible platform, but we've also been able to then work with them to reorganize their information architecture and redesign their homepages and, and kind of clean up the content as we go. And, and particularly in this round, uh, we're working with the Department of Children and Families, um, Child Support Services, Department of Human Services, um, uh, Office of Rehabilitation Services, which is all about services for people with disabilities, um, Office of uh, the Blind and Visually Impaired. So um, these are sites where this stuff really matters. Uh, it's a population that really needs to get access to this content quickly and easily. Um, we know that uh, in most cases, over half the traffic is coming from a mobile device. So the, 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 the bandwidth requirements and the performance on small screens is, is hugely important. And you know, even though they've built up all of these content structures, again, we know that when it gets to that small screen, it's still going to work just as well. And one of the, another part of this, this process that I think is really interesting is that we've built a mechanism to migrate content and that's actually part of the distribution. So we created a, a way where we can spider the old site, create two spreadsheets, one for pages, one for files, and then we can run a migration to pull that content into the site, bring in all the old URLs as redirects, and, and so we're preserving all the paths and all the bookmarks people have to old sites. So um, one of the sites that we're getting ready to do uh, later this summer is, is taxation. Um, they are legally required to maintain every single one of those files and they all have to maintain that same URL. So, so it's critical that we were able to do these things. And, and that was what Phil and Ben did such an amazing job putting together the migration process. So we're using the migration API um, this is all in Drupal 9. I don't think I, I said that earlier. Um, and, uh, and, and this is all uh, set up as um, three different repositories, all on GitHub, all public. So it's all open source. And uh, it pulls in the pattern library and it pulls in the profile into a distribution. And that is what's being deployed out to, uh, out to uh, Acquia Site Factory. And, and so we're, we've been able to leverage all of that. Plus we've got um, the whole suite of um, it's, you know, their white label version of Cloudflare uh, for content distribution network and web application firewall. So the security and the performance is off the charts. Um, it's really, really good. And, and so having all of those things together has enabled us to make a quantum leap ahead in, in terms of the accessibility and performance and reliability of, of the infrastructure. Um, so I've been talking about a lot of stuff and, and I think maybe it'd be good to kind of pause for a minute and, and see if anybody has questions about any of the stuff that I've shown you so far. Yeah, Jason, can you clarify for us, uh, Tim in the chat was asking, um, uh, Drupal multi-site is uh, different than Acquia Site Factory. Um, and I said that, you know, you guys are using a distribution uh, type workflow with Site Factory. You talked about that a little bit just a minute ago. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail there as to how, how that kind of works? Sure. Um, well, so the, the difference between the two is on the surface, it's, it's not that different in that if you're running a big multi-site install and you deploy new code, you're kind of by default deploying that new code to every one of those sites. And, and that's really not that different from when you are using a distribution and site factory, because when you deploy new code, it will deploy that update across every single site that you have on there. And it does it in batches. So it, it um, uh, there's more to it, but, uh, but generally speaking, um, Multi-site, you really, it is literally just one site that you have installed. Um, what I mentioned about the, the way things were set up with the state of Georgia as one big multi-site install, the challenge that I had with that is you were all the time basically spinning up 80 sites. And you might not have all the databases and stuff, but from a code perspective and a build process, um, it, was, it was challenging. 
And so that was one of the things that I had in mind in trying to keep an eye out for the developer experience was to make sure that if we went the route of a distribution, then you would still get the same benefit of multi-site in that you're only working with one code base. It just so happens that you're kind of pushing it out that same code base to a bunch of separate sites instead of one directory. So there's a couple of things going on there that I felt were, were important um, for this architecture, given that we know we are dealing with separate agency websites. Um, a single multi-site instance is a single point of failure. Um, so if that update goes wrong, you've just taken down every single website in the network. Um, and I've seen that happen in Colorado um, and that, that could potentially happen um, in, uh, in Georgia. And, and so it's, it's not that it's necessarily wrong. And if you have a good caching infrastructure in front of it, like Cloudflare, um, you could, or, you know, a really good varnish setup. I mean, basically the whole thing could go down and nobody would know if everything was, was cached for long enough, but that does add a, a certain amount of risk. And so given that the state was already interested in going with Acquia and Site Factory because they would like a simpler method of deploying new sites, um, it seemed ideal for us to lean into this. So the distribution, no, I don't, I don't make it, but effectively what you're doing is taking all of the work that you, that you put into creating a single site, exporting all that configuration into code and wrapping it up into an install profile. That, that's more or less what's going on. I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, but then every time when you are doing updates, you have to tie in and do all the update hooks and all that 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 stuff. But but generally speaking, um, the deploy process um, takes us a couple hours, and so you know once everything's merged in, um, we put it out to a, it. It builds up and we put it out to a test environment. And if the test environment goes well, then deploying it out to production is is actually quite a bit faster. Now that's not with seven hundred sites, um, but you know it it still um, it's going relatively quickly so far. Um, I mean, when we do a deploy now, we have, uh, it's probably 30 or so sites that are created. Uh, if you factor in all the demos, all the sites that are in development, all the sandboxes that we've created for individuals to, to practice with and stuff like that. So, so we're starting to get a feel for what it's going to look like as we have more and more sites live in the environment. Great. Um, as far as um, customizing the sites, have you guys had to do any um, individual customizations to for, for a site or is everything really strictly um, pulled back into the, to the distribution and, and you know available for everybody? Well, so that's been an interesting thing about Site Factory is if you're running them all on the same install profile, you don't really have a choice. It's all or nothing. So um, the way we've addressed that is we're using features. So we've wrapped up all of the, um, so, so we have a number of content types and components that are core that we, that we know everybody's going to use. But a good example would be looking at the, uh, what will be the new governor's site. They also have speeches and executive orders. They're the only people that need that why have all of this functionality turned on for every single site? Um, that is something of a, a, a matter of debate that we're kind of going through right now. But I believe pretty strongly that you want to present the simplest admin experience as possible. So if you don't need to have 30 different content types, don't have 30 different content types, it's going to overwhelm people. So we set it up so that with each of the slightly less than absolutely essential features, uh, things like publications that are migrated and imported uh, for uh, the COVID site from the main Department of Health site. They're the only ones who need it. They're the only ones who get it turned on. Uh, if people aren't using events, we don't turn it on. Um, and so all those things are actually available. We can enable them, but we don't have to. And so we keep a smaller security footprint per site and we keep a smaller admin a sort of cognitive load per site in, in, in doing that. So, so far that has generally worked okay. Um, and, and so 
that's how we are tackling the idea of individualization. But, but the themes are no different. The components that they get are no different. Um, but it's the combination of them that allows it to be pretty unique. Interesting. So there's a, a question in the chat from uh, Salim. He's asking, are your templates open, available for other agencies to use? Well, the, all, the, all the repositories are public. So if you wanted to fork it and use it, you could. I mean, I think there's certainly some you know, fairly Rhode Island centric things in the design system, but it wouldn't, once you get to know Pattern Lab, it wouldn't be that hard to, um, to really make it unique. Um, there, you know, there are a lot of uh, things in there. I didn't actually get into some of the most remarkable stuff about how we did the color theming is it's all driven off a single JSON file. So all the colors are defined and, and then the colors are mapped into sets for each uh, each color theme. And that is in turn what gets built out into all of the SAS variables, all the CSS custom properties, and it's even tied into being read into the admin interface. So one of the things that I uh, wanted to show you was if we went to look at this demo site and I wanted to change that color theme, it's actually a theme setting. So I can just go in here and, and you can see all the text in the footer, all those, each of those different blocks you can, you can alter. You can change the text that goes next to the logo if you can upload a different logo if you want. And then the theme option, we can just go in here and change it. And so we save that and go back to the site. And there we go. And, and so um, what, what we've done is tried to create a platform that will give a huge amount of flexibility to create all different kinds of sites. And the hope is that while we're focused primarily on executive branch agencies for now, as this grows, the web services team at the state will be able to tackle more and more sites. And, and we can either go the route of adding more themes or uh, adding more color themes within this same, like we only have one ECMS theme, that's it. And, and that's um, all the color flexibility is built into that. So we can add more color themes there, or you can go the route of, you can extend things a little bit um, with Site Factory by pulling in different themes to a, an install profile, or you can create multiple install profiles. And I'm assuming um, I, I would love to talk to, to you, Joel, about this a bit. Um, that Brown probably has multiple install profiles. And, and that's one way of, of, of handling this. So if we, for example, needed to do something super unique for one of these agencies, we could either make a feature that compiles a whole bunch of custom stuff for them, or we could simply make another install profile that's essentially a child of this one that kind of inherits all of this stuff and then adds in the other functionality that we want. If you're interested in learning more about the design system and the uh, use of JSON and, and Twig and, and that sort of stuff, I just dropped a link to a blog post uh, on the UMF blog that uh, goes into detail of how that works. And actually, Jay did a pretty good job of explaining it in the D4D webinar we did a few weeks ago. And I think the video for that is available too. Jason, to answer your question, yes, we do have multiple install profiles. We try to run the bulk of our academic departments and offices off of a kind of a standardized one. But for a lot mm -hmm. of the schools, because we do have like the medical school has its own right. but on ACSF engineering school, you know, they got their own profiles, uh, probably to account for future growth too. We're not going to know what right. they're going to need two or three years down the road. Uh, so right. we did put them on their own profiles. Yeah, it's it's an interesting challenge. Um, I'm working with another agency with Tufts doing something similar. And at the moment, we're working with the vet school, which encompasses not only the vet school, but but also like seven different animal hospitals. And so it is a really interesting kind of challenge 
I mean, you're really trying to think at a number of different altitudes every time you start working on something like this, because you're, you're always trying to balance everything from the user experience all the way through to the hosting experience and the developer experience and kind of everything in between. And, um, and, and yeah, I don't think you can ever do one size that really fits everybody, but um, the features approach I'm overall I'm liking so far um, because I, I, that really, it still keeps us in a single code base and it gives us this little escape valve to, uh, to create something that is, is really unique. And, and so could somebody technically go turn it on on their site? Sure. But this isn't, you, you know, we're like, we're all in the family here. Like, you know, so like all, all these Rhode Island sites, you know, we know, and, and if it's not right for them, then, you know, it's not doing them any good to turn it on. Um, and, and we still keep, you know, the sort of the Drupal admin role that's still centralized with the department of IT. So um, it's not something that the agency owners themselves would have that level of access to enable modules. But so far the workflow stuff has been working really quite nicely. Great, any, uh, any other questions? It's, it's not a question, but I will say, I mean, I think the design work is, is beautiful and I love this idea a lot. I'm getting, I'm getting ideas from it uh, myself <laughs> or, <laughs> cause we have a lot of different similar, like, you know, we try to keep sites with a yeah. visual family. Um, so I like the idea of kind of, of this. So thank you, really, thank you for sharing, sure. it's great. Um, I look, I'll sit down with you anytime. Uh, I mean, that's um, we've actually, I think we've, we've all worked with, with Brown's web services team at some point in the past. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and actually, ironically enough, um, Jed O'Connor and, uh, and Bill Denon are, are two of our technical account managers um, uh, with Acquia on the project. So it's all, it's just like Rhode Island. It's a, it's a small place. <laughs> right. But, uh, but it's, it's really good. And, and a lot of these ideas um, actually originated when my wife and I had our own business. We designed Yale's Grad School of Arts and Sciences website, um, working with the, with the Yale Sites platform uh, going back, um, I guess, five, six years ago now. Um, and and, that, and so, so this, these ideas of how to create variability with some through lines of consistency in government and universities, it's really, really similar. And, and so, you know, giving people enough to feel like they can control their own destiny while still maintaining, yes. you know, you've given them a substantially better mousetrap. And, and so th that very often can help kind of counterbalance some of the, the loss of perceived freedom. Um, but, you know, it's at the end of the day, they still are going to find find ways to do things the way they want to do them. There's only, you can only do so much, but, um, but I am finding so far that people have been remarkably receptive to better practices when you can give them a good reason why and make it easier for them to do the right thing. And, and so that's really where a lot of the guidance, and, and I think that's where a lot of our room for improvement is, um, is in better help guidance actually right, you know, in line in the process. We want to be able to like link out to the documentation right away. We want to um, build better linting in. We've been, um, I actually uh, am starting to talk to the site improve folks um, to see about how that might be incorporated into the platform. I know Georgia is working with them pretty closely and making it available to all of their agencies. And, and I know that they have a Drupal module and, and can do some things about testing pages before you publish them so that you can actually check the language and make sure it's inclusive, um, check the alt tags and make sure they're good quality. And, and uh, like they can actually perform a lot of pretty smart analysis um, that can go beyond the, the basics of what we can do in the mechanics of providing accessibility and get into you know, whether or not you should use ampersands. And the answer is usually no. But, but, you know, like those, those things are not in people's, they're not in their vernacular. It's not on their mind. Like those things, like that's not their job to know how to write properly for the web, you know, or for different 
uh, uh, different populations, but but give them some reasons why they should do it that way. And most people want to do the right thing. Um, and and I will say that, um, you know, it's 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 really gratifying when someone that uh, is initially a skeptic really becomes a convert. Um, and, and really embraces it because you've given them a good tool. It's easier than what they had before. They don't have to write any code and, and you've given them some good reasons why to do it one way versus another. Um, and seeing them pick that up and run with it is awesome. 